He's the man, he's the myth, he's the legend, he's the scientist with all the answers and all the questions. It's time for another episode of Alex's Science Corner. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, please. You know what's cool is watch going through and editing, and you can see the claps in the audio track. I thought that little chihuahua had come back in the studio. Alex, what's going on in the wide, wide world of science, my friend? All right, so first story, if uh, you've read the New York Times like Brian did, you may have seen an article that said, Surprise from the supervolcano under Yellowstone. And the impression you get from the New York Times article is that any minute now the supervolcano underneath Yellowstone Park is going to explode. And kill and, us all. Yeah, and I never knew what the actual. I never knew them to be into sensationalizing the news. It, well, it's not. I'm not going to go into more detail about that at the moment. But okay. so, so a, here's what super, the researchers yeah. figured out. What they figured out is, in the history of the times that that super volcano has gone off, they used to think it would take a thousand years from the time that the event started for the uh, for the eruption to the time of the actual eruption. They've cut that time down to about 20 to 30 years. So once they see certain events start happening, it'll take about 20 to 30 years for the super volcano to go off. They do not see any of those events. There's nothing going on in Yellowstone that's giving them any indication that any of those events are happening or are going to happen in the near future. The only part of the article that is there is that instead of taking a thought, they thought it would take a thousand years, they now realize it only take about 20 or 30 years, which in geological terms is a blink of an eye. So for geologists, it can happen really, really fast. And, and there's nothing it. they can do to, to to release some of that pressure. So it won't there happen. have been some stories where supposedly some geologists have said, oh, you dig down there to relieve the pressure off of the magma chamber underneath. Nobody's actually talking about that. It was, again, some writer came up with this idea that it's like popping a bubble. You pop the bubble and let it drip out to... There's, it's not going to, they don't have anything that'll relieve it. It's mostly if they started seeing something like that happen, you got about 20 years to get people out of the way. Okay. Okay. But none of that is happening currently. It's just that, oh, it wasn't going to take as long as we thought it was. And that's all. So having these geysers, Old Faithful, and some of the other ones that are there, uh, and some of these hot pools that are there, do they, are they in? Indicative of the fact that there is this. There is stuff a magma pool there. under there, and they've known about that for as long as they've been doing ge- geological research of Yellowstone National Park. The challenge, of course, is when they figured out that it's part of a huge caldera for the super volcano. The volcano and the magma pool underneath is doing a whole bunch of stuff that it normally does, and it's not going to become a super a super volcano. But when it starts acting like a super volcano, we're going to have about 20, 30 years before it actually blows. Okay. And that's the difference. And that's the only thing the actual article said. So go out there and see it now while you can. Yes. Because you've only got 20 to 30 years. Because it's a beautiful park. Because if it started happening tomorrow, you've only got 20 to 30 years to. Do they say how, how much land it would take up if this thing. Exploded. Oh, pretty much be all of Yellowstone National Park would okay. go. And then uh, with the winds the way they are, we'd probably get between one to three inches of ash in our area. All the way down our th- uh, yeah. to the East Coast. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. We're screwed. Yeah. And, so go know, see the park while you can. It's a beautiful park, you know? <laughs> Maybe you'll be at ground zero when it happens, too, you know? And <laughs> and if it started it. tomorrow, you've only got twenty years left to do what, that. What a great vacation! The super <laughs> volcano went off, and we were there to see it. We posted it on Facebook. We're gone, but you can still see our Facebook post. 
<laughs> so next story is brain waves reflect different types of learning. Now, I spent time uh, at a teaching school, and I know Brian has too. And I know one of the things that teaching schools teach is that people have different learning styles, which is some people learn better by reading, some people learn better by lecture, some people learn better by physically doing something. Most of that is, I don't want to say bupkis, but too much of a simplification to be useful. This is now what this article is talking about. What this article is talking about is that there are certain types of physical reflective learning that a person does that they can observe in the brain and even if a person doesn't remember doing it they still learn it for example if you learn how to ride a bike or you learn how to do tricks on a bike you may not amnesiacs will not remember learning how to ride the bike but they will have learned how to ride the bike so if they were to get back on the bike, they would know how to do it. Right. And they, so if they start learning, memory. for example, if you learn to do a bike trick or a trick on a bike, an amnesiac would not remember that they did any if of these tricks. they know tricks, how to do it. But they have learned how to do it mm-hmm. because it, is a, it has an actual physical learning style and they can see how that is affected in the brain. And it's also in the muscle, right? It's called muscle memory. Well, that's the result of it. We call muscle memory, but your brain is what's doing that. Okay. Okay. Next up is uh, last common ancestor of humans and apes weighed about 12 pounds. And uh, what this is finding is that between 5 to 23 million years ago, humans and apes, our common ancestor, were separated. smaller? Oh, yeah, we were much smaller, and the ape ancestor was smaller, too. And there's a, there's a point where humans and apes left the trees. And this is the point. And so our previous ancestor, the ancestor for humans and apes, started in the trees, and this is as far back as we've gone, that our common ancestor, they were still in the trees. And then at some point after that, our common ancestor left the trees, and humans and apes diverged. So so we had a very small ancestor that separated from the trees. So we were like the, the people on Avatar. Um, they lived in the trees. No, they lived in a tree. Never never in saw the, the movie. You never saw the movie? They lived never in the saw trees? The movie. There, were, there were different tribes. Some lived by the ocean, some lived on and the And they were also trees. like eight feet tall, too. Yeah, they were very tall. So I don't think we can count that as part of what we were talking about. And they would fly. They would climb up to these areas. Mm -hmm. That's a great movie. But they lived in the trees. So that's kind of what you Inside of a tree. They lived in, they used a tree, they dug out the tree and lived inside of a tree. They lived in the branches, too. Their their beds were hanging from the branches. Those, you don't remember that? It wasn't just inside the tree. Okay, go ahead. Uh, We'll go on. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we'll discuss that off, off air. Yeah, uh, last one is the smallest planet that we've seen that has a ring around it like Saturn is one of the dwarf planets in the Kuiper belt. It's called a trans-Newtonian object. It's uh, Haumea, which is one of the dwarf it's planets. It's homemade? Haumea. How did you name. make it? You can reach across and slap her. <laughs> Feel free. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll just call it the dwarf planet, that one of good. many. <laughs> and they found that it does have a ring around it of material. And one of the things about that makes it so interesting is Haumea is small enough that it's not got enough gravity to put itself in a circular shape like larger worlds. And so its gravity field is kind of distorted, and yet it still has a ring around it of material. So why is it considered a planet if it doesn't have enough? It's of... big enough to be larger than what they consider an asteroid. And okay, that's one it's... of those definitions that makes it weird. Um, we do know that asteroids can have moons around them. And uh, this is the smallest object that we've seen that has a ring around it. Okay. So that'll be it. All right. 
Sorry to say you can't call and ask Alex any questions, but you can go to this Facebook page, Alex's Science Corner, or you can go to Saturday Morning Club and ask any questions about these stories or anything else science-related. And, and I see no posts right now. Well, give them a chance to start typing. Seriously, Bobby. No, I mean Back at off, all. Baby. I mean all. I mean, aside from Alex's Science Corner, there have been no. There are no. I, I see no posts on the, the page. It's okay. So. It's going to be okay. Okay. All right. Here is the drive-by truckers.